What's happening, everybody? James Hancock here. Hope everyone is enjoying the long weekend. I'm back to review episode six of season two of Westworld, an episode called Phase Space. And I noticed a peculiar thing between episode five and episode six is that there were very few articles written about new theories regarding Westworld. I don't know if that's a sign of people losing interest in just the rampant speculation about the plot, or if it's just a natural byproduct of the fact that we now have less of the show in front of us than behind us, and they're just fewer options as to where the show might go. But if you're looking for a great online source of somebody who basically compiles all the best theories, Kim Renfro over at Insider does a really good job. And my favorite theory that she discussed between last episode and now is whether or not the man in black is a host who simply doesn't know that his human body has died. There's been a lot of speculation about whose mind might be digitally imprinted on that red pearl that we've seen in a few episodes. I'm not 100% convinced of that, mostly because in tonight's episode, he sure seemed awfully human in a lot of his conversations with his daughter, Emily. But when it comes to tonight's episode, there are always new little details to savor and enjoy. I don't know if they've done this before, but I noticed in the recap of the storylines leading in tonight's episode, usually in a TV show when they're showing recaps, you'll get specific lines of dialogue that kind of help bring the audience up to speed as to where the story is. But what I liked about tonight's recap it just had percussion beats and it had a lot of interesting images so if you know the show it was a great reminder of where this episode might be going but it didn't feel the need to just completely totally guide the viewer by the hand through all the backstory leading up to tonight now one of the most important things to pay attention to on this show is when the show is in different aspect ratios because sometimes those aspect ratios clue us into what timelines we might be watching oftentimes the show is just in a typical 16 by 9 aspect ratio like the shape of our tvs whereas other times it has that classic 2.35 to 1 epic widescreen western flavor that I know and love from the films of like Sam Peckinpah and so many other directors like that. And both aspect ratios are employed in this episode, but the episode opens with a really cool scene between Dolores and Bernard. And it's not completely clear when this scene takes place. You can make a very compelling argument that this scene takes place before the giant lake with all the dead bodies, or in the immediate aftermath. But we see a continuation of the scene between Arnold and Dolores, but surprise, surprise, Dolores is actually in control of the conversation and actually has him cease his motor functions at one point because he's not going through his lines of dialogue the way he's supposed to or the way he originally did. From Arnold's point of view, we can see that he's working through a very specific important choice he has to make about what's gonna happen when the hosts outgrow the park. But from Dolores' point of view, she is testing the fidelity of this particular Arnold. Because as we learned at the end of last episode, and as we saw a lot of this episode, Dolores isn't really interested in spending time with people who don't have complete, total, blind loyalty to her. As we saw at the end of last episode, Teddy basically got rewritten against his will to not only be more loyal, but also to be stronger and less merciful. And we see that he's in total badass mode this episode. And he's even aware of the fact that he was rewritten, but the way he discusses it it's hard to even read him whether or not it's something he resents or not. But on two occasions, Teddy shows that he's become almost more ruthless than the man in black because there's a human who's refusing to answer questions about Abernathy, and Teddy just blows him away. And then much later in the episode, when they're using the train as a projectile to attack the headquarters of Delos, he gives one of the Westworld technicians a gun and a single round of ammunition so that he can kill himself before the explosion. That's his one gesture of mercy. I'm going to continue to pay very close attention to how Teddy behaves around Dolores and whether or not his blind loyalty is completely ironclad. But if Dolores seems like she's kind of going psycho on us, the human characters in this show are no less we see that Charlotte Hale is capable of some horrific brutality in the way that she treats Abernathy. We see that after Abernathy was successfully retrieved from that giant battle sequence, they've taken him back to Delos, and as a way of making sure that he stays put as they poke around inside of his head, they basically take this giant bolt gun with these huge metal stakes and just blast him through his arm and legs. It's pretty cruel and unusual punishment, but as she points out, it'll keep him from squirming around too much. We can see that even Ashley Stubbs is a little caught off guard by such an extreme measure. But the main storyline that this episode wraps up is all the stuff going on in Shogun World. And I have to say, even though I'm loath and reluctant to admit it, that perhaps the entire side plot or subplot in Shogun World might have been a waste of time because as we see most of the characters from Shogun World stay where they came from because I did enjoy ingredients of it. We see a killer duel sequence between Musashi and Tanaka in this. That was a lot of fun to watch, but in terms of the overall broad Westworld narrative, I'm not entirely convinced it wasn't just a distraction. 
at the end of season one, when we saw that suit of armor in the headquarters and everybody was like, oh my God, there's a Shogun world. Our imagination just got set ablaze thinking about what a Shogun world might look like. And if they just let Shogun world remain like that, people would be talking about Shogun world for years to come. It's almost like that reference to the Clone Wars in the 1977 Star Wars film, where for decades, people were freaking out imagining what the Clone Wars might be like. In any case, Musashi and Akane decide to stay behind in Shogun world, but the rest of our crew escapes back to Westworld. Now we get a long scene this episode between the man in black and his daughter Emily and they hash out a lot of their family history and a lot of their differences and while she still considers them a piece of shit for having been not the nicest father in the world she is willing to concede that it was horrible on her part to blame the death of her mother on William. And it actually even gets to be kind of a tender scene. We see that Ed Harris, who's just one of the finest actors alive, how his eyes are getting all moist. We actually see his soft and tender side, maybe the first time in 16 episodes of Westworld. But what I liked even more was watching him kind of cringe in embarrassment when Emily talks about how when she went to the Raj, she finally realized that she was old enough to go to some of the pleasure palaces. So who knows what she was up to. But they seem to come to an agreement where William is willing to leave the park and not go out in a blaze of glory and spend more time with Emily if he's able to burn Westworld down behind him. However, when she wakes up, William has totally screwed her over because as we see, William and Lawrence and the rest of them have completely vanished. So something tells me Emily's not gonna take no for an answer quite so quickly. So I, I think it's a foregone conclusion. She'll be popping up again before the end of the season. When it comes to Elsie and Bernard and their subplot, we get some interesting details as to why the park is so difficult to regain control over because the cradle, basically this hive mind of data and storylines that basically controls all the different narratives going on in the park, it's improvising and rewriting itself and refusing to be hacked. And Bernard gets the idea of going with Elsie to the heart of the cradle and removing his own little pearl brain and patching it directly into the cradle, essentially inserting Bernard into one of the narratives in the cradle. And as soon as that happens, it's almost like he's a guest entering Westworld for the first time. And once again, we get that great 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio. And from his POV in this narrative, the park is still functioning totally normally. Everybody's walking about their business. Everybody's just following their normal storylines. But we get this killer reveal. It's a kick-ass cliffhanger for the episode when Bernard, aka Arnold, walks into a saloon. And who do we see playing the piano? But Anthony Hopkins, aka Ford himself. I was terrified that we wouldn't see some of Anthony Hopkins this season. And I think a lot of people have talked about how they feel like something is missing from season two. And depending on one's taste in storytelling, there can be a lot of factors as to why this show might appear to some to have something missing that makes it essential viewing. I've been thoroughly enjoying it, but I think some of the novelty and the originality of the first season perhaps has been lost. But the biggest thing that's been lost is Anthony Hopkins. He's absolute acting royalty. And so I think having him back for the latter part of the season will be a nice shot in the arm making the show more interesting. The big question is, why the hell is he there? And I feel like this is when all the internet speculation is going to go stark raving mad. Because I was working under the assumption that the only thing left of Ford in the show was that involved with the game that he's created for the Man in Black. But perhaps Ford has had a long game all along where he and Arnold would be reunited and come up with a scheme whereby the host would be allowed to exit into the outside world. One of my favorite bits of speculation as to the reason that there are so many bodies in that giant lake in episode one is because the hosts have left their bodies behind and crossed over into the real world. We're almost getting into like Planet of the Apes territory. I think it was the, the fourth movie where you see the apes literally like throwing off their chains and taking over the world. But it wouldn't surprise me if this show gets into that territory before the end of the season. But when it comes to wrapping up Maeve's storyline, as I mentioned before, she and the rest of her crew make it back to Westworld. And as they made it back and I was thinking about what might have been with Shogun World. What could have been cool is if they brought in a director, say like Takashi Miike. While Takashi Miike makes these crazy like horror movies and gangster movies, he also occasionally does things like 13 Assassins, which are these big, bold remakes of classic Japanese sagas from the 1960s. But that might have made those Shogun World scenes a little bit more convincing. At any rate, Maeve decides that it's time to find her daughter. She strolls through the fields to her old house. She finds her daughter. They're having a nice little bonding session. But surprise, surprise, Maeve realizes that there's yet another host there who looks almost like Maeve, who's acting out the role of her daughter's mother. The situation gets a little hectic because the ghost nation arrives, and it seems initially as if they're attacking. However, one of them says to Maeve, come with us. It's almost like an invitation. However, Maeve's little army of assassins that she has, they immediately go into battle and start fighting the ghost nation. Something tells me the ghost nation and Maeve are going to join forces. And granted, my prediction about Maeve coming back to Westworld with an army of samurai turned out to be 
totally false, but maybe a good substitute for an army of samurai would be an army of badass Ghost Nation warriors. And then in the teaser, we get some interesting juicy shots where we see Charlotte entering a room that's full of Bernards. Make of that what you will. And we also get a lot of flashes and images of all hell breaking loose in the Dalis Corporation with Dolores and Teddy and their minions on the warpath. I think that shot of the room full of Arnold's as well as the cliffhanger involving Ford are probably going to be the things that people sink their teeth into most over the next couple days. So it is fun that this show still invites that kind of rampant internet speculation. As I mentioned in my previous video, as much as we shouldn't allow our obsession with the plot and spoilers and what's going to happen be our main focus, because in the end, this is an experience. It's not just about educated guesswork and seeing who's right. However, that guesswork is one of the main things that drives the popularity of the show. So I think it's important to embrace some of that, enjoy it, but not let it become the focus of the Westworld experience. At any rate, I really enjoyed tonight's episode. It wasn't necessarily a home run episode, but I was definitely glued to the screen from start to finish, wondering, wondering what was going to happen. I think it was a step up from the previous episode. Like I said, I had really high hopes for Shogun World, and it just didn't quite seem to matter in the long run. It seemed like a two-episode diversion or distraction as opposed to a key ingredient to the overall story. But who knows? Maybe I'll turn out to be wrong. Maybe we'll see some giant payoff in the episode to come. But I hope you enjoyed my reaction and review. Please consider subscribing to my channel. I would really appreciate it. But for everybody who's been following my channel, I really appreciate the support. I always appreciate the comments. And when it comes to shows like Westworld, definitely feed me any and all ideas that you have about where the story might be going or how you might be reacting so far. The best place to reach me is always on Twitter at Colbrex, but obviously comments on this channel are equally good. And coming up this week, got a review of Legion, a review of Expanse. Very big news when it comes to the Expanse because the Expanse did get picked up for a season four at Amazon. So sometimes things do have a happy ending after all. But I'm going to save all my expanse related material for Wednesday evening. So as always, thank you so much for watching my channel, but more importantly, onwards and upwards.